me do that. There we go. Um, if you go to atm.us and you go to the Schoology page, there is a section on there called ALSDE resources. And if you click on that, you'll see a blue folder that contains all of the webinars that we've done in August and September, as well as a lot of other goodies that you might be interested in. Um, this recording, I should have this one uploaded by this afternoon. Um, so I'm just gonna take a quick minute and my ATIM specialists that are here, if you guys would unmute and just introduce yourself and then we'll get started. Hey, Barry Wigginton, University of North Alabama. Hey, I'm Brooke Beasy, University of Montevallo, which is Region 7. Robert Mabin, the University of Alabama, University of West Alabama In-Service Center, Region 4. Roll Tide. Carol Foster, Auburn University, Region 9, War Eagle. And while I'm thinking about it, we just got an email from our boss at the state. And if you didn't know this, I believe tomorrow is hashtag why I apply day. It's recognizing applications for colleges. And I know the State Department's encouraging us to wear our favorite college t-shirt tomorrow, um, where we work or where you went to college. Um, so I don't know if that's something you guys are participating in, but something to think about if you want to encourage applications for um, college. All right, so we're gonna just jump right in and look at um, this whole scenario of schools PLP and Schoology. Um, we're gonna look at um, finding the content. Uh, once you find it, what do you do with it? Um, so all of this, and, and the one thing I will say is that sometimes uh, I'm gonna be saying something you're like, I already know that. I mean, we've been in school, how long? Um, so hang with me, be sure you participate in the chat. So if you have a comment or you have something to add, or you know what, if you're going, Brandy, that's totally wrong because I'm experiencing this in the classroom and here's what I know, jump in there and put the chat, uh, tell me that in the chat and my ATEM specialists will um, stop me if there's a question I need to address right then or we'll address those at the end. So the first thing is locating the school's PLP content. Now, um, you first have to kind of know your way around Schoology, and it's important to note up at the top, courses, groups, and resources. So resources is your personal filing cabinet if you're right here under personal in Schoology. So anything that you create, you can store in resources. And actually, you can use this add resources button, and you can add items right here to your personal filing cabinet that can then be copied and imported into your courses. Um, and these resources are group resources. Um, I'm sorry, these are personal resources that are private to you. So if you make them, they're here, they're only for you. And another type of resources at the bottom are the apps that you can include. Like if you're a Google school, you can include the Google Drive app. You can have that connected, OneDrive, um, lots of different apps. So that's a part of resources too. It's sort of like your toolbox of resources. The one that you're going to want to focus on when it comes to schools PLP is, um, sorry, I've got the two screens going, so my cursor went away to the other screen, um, is the group resources. So in order to access <clears throat> your school's PLP content, your district has probably created a group resource and that's where your course content lives. Now, I sent this out to my ATEM specialist yesterday because I think we're all learning things as we go. And I know of a district who has their um, school's PLP content housed under school resources. So how about this? I cannot confirm or deny, but based on a Facebook group that I'm a part of, one teacher said, if you put the school's PLP stuff in school resources, the students, if they dig far enough, can access that content in school resources. So that is a district thing and your district should have set up the school's PLP content in a group because that group requires you to join it. 
If it's a school resource, you're automatically a part of it. But guess what? So are all the students. And so this was a revelation to me seeing that a teacher said, hey, if it's in school resources and the um, students figure out that they have access to that, then all the answer keys, everything is there. So just an FYI, if you know that your PLP content, and I, I say PLP because it's a lot easier to say than school's PLP and Schoology, um, but if you find that your content is in school resources, it might be a conversation um, that you need to have regarding uh, where the district has these folders. So we want them to be in group resources. You don't have any control over that, but hopefully you have found them by now. You'll see the school's PLP folder, the access franchise content, proficiency scales, and there are several more. And uh, we'll look at those shortly, but this is where you'll locate all of the good stuff. So here's the several more. There's also a fantastic resource now called the Standards Crosswalk. If your district has updated the content here in this resource, you should see a Standards Crosswalk. And that is where you're going to access the standards that match your class. And um, they are constantly working on these. You can see that this um, screenshot I have said it was added September 10th. As they get them updated, you'll see that date change. And so that's where you can get standards for your course. That's important because when you're searching through that school's PLP content, it can be very daunting. And you wanna make sure that the stuff that you use from there aligns with your content. So the State Department is working diligently to make you have these crosswalks so that you can see how that works. If for some reason you don't see that, then you can have access to this live binder. And let me see if I um, put this in the notes. Hold on just a second. So I tried to remember, yes. And so I do have the link to this live binder. So I'm actually gonna copy that. I'm gonna put that in the chat as well, <clears throat> just because if you don't know about this, the State Department has this fantastic resource. It is, they're calling it um, the learning repository. So if you have heard that phrase and did not know what it was, this is it. You talk about daunting. This can be very intimidating. It is like a big mega binder with colored tabs. But I wanted you to see that you can find your standards, your crosswalks, as well as pacing guides for schools PLP in this document. So if you have not seen it or you thought, I don't know how that's useful to me, definitely check out right here. So I gave you a link, I think it's a direct link where this one is clicked, but the way this works is you would click on a tab and then you would see some yellow tabs at the bottom that would open up. So imagine like those are subdivisions and then you'll find what you're looking for in those subdivisions. So it's either going to be in a folder within your group resources called Standards Crosswalk, or you can find it here in the Live Binder. So in the chat, give me a yes or a thumbs up if you have known about this and have been using it. So go ahead and drop that in the chat. Yes, thumbs up, I've seen it, I've used it. Or you can say, no, never heard of it. First time I've heard of it. Um, because we're really trying to make sure you're no, you know about all the resources that are available. All right, so I borrowed this little animation from uh, Barry. He is in this uh, with us from UNA. Um, and this is a great little screenshot. And I believe he got this from Kristen Dillard, who's been loading those um, crosswalks. And this is just showing you that there are certain crosswalk documents that are completed and currently live in Schoology, like math, like science, like ELA 9 through 12 and social studies 7 through 12. These other ones over here are in the works. So if you're an elementary reading teacher, you're gonna find a document there, but it is not the full document with the crosswalk. It's gonna have the lessons from schools PLP. It's going to have 
the standard, the national standard, but the benefit of these crosswalk documents is that, and here's a great um, graphic. This is the ELA, and I'm a high school English teacher, so I loved this. This is the ELA crosswalk. It has nine through 12. It starts with the very first lesson, lesson one, and you can't see at the bottom, this is just a screenshot, but at the bottom it's tabbed. So you can see 9, 10, 11, 12th grade English, and you'll see the national standard and the Alabama standard. This right here is a huge help as you're trying to decide what school's PLP content to use. And then I've got my hot tip there. If you don't know about this, you can use the control key plus the F key to find a certain word. So if you know the standard, but within that standard, you're looking more specifically for something like the word theme, I can do control F, a little search box will pop up, and I can search within this document and it will highlight all of the times that the word theme shows up. It's a super handy tool, works in um, Chrome. I believe it works in most browsers. If you have a Mac, it is command F. But on all other computers, I believe it's control F. So the school's PLP content, um, I showed you where you can access it. Um, and then I mentioned that your group may be called, your resource may be called something besides course content, but that's where you can access it. And um, notice here that once you start drilling into those folders, you're going to see this big breadcrumb trail. Um, and that is super important. And this, I can't emphasize enough. It will take a little while for you to find what you're looking for. So I had a teacher tell me, get a snack, get your popcorn, because it's going to take a minute for you to drill down into these folders. So look, I went to my group resource, schools PLP, the grade level, the um, social studies, just the overarching subject, then a specific subject, then a specific um, unit, then a specific lesson. Um, this to me is a little simpler at the middle and high school levels. When you get into elementary, many of those unit names are not telling of what is in the unit. So those crosswalk, crosswalk documents and pacing guides are very helpful. My pro tip, go into your course resources folder and download the pacing guide. Remember I said it was in the live binder. It is also here in the school's PLP content folder. So once I go to my US history course in like the course resources folder, I'm going to find the pacing guide. It's usually about the second or third document down there um, in that folder. So once I have found my content, by going through resources and hunting it down, because in resources, it allows me to click the hyperlink and view that particular learning object. The fastest way to get it all into your course is to go to your course. Okay, so I'm just gonna quickly show you what I mean. I'm gonna pull um, this one over here and look at a particular course. So here I am in a course that I teach. And if I'm going to add something to this course, I'm going to add these elements to the course. It is much easier for me to go here and import this from resources and grab it from the group. So the reason why I say that is because it allows me to check multiple learning objects within schools PLP. So if I go to K-5, I go to pre-K, and I go here to this one, and I go into health, and I go like it's a long process, I can check this box and grab a bunch and pull that in to my course. Now, the difference in that versus going to resources, and this is where I say get a snack and hunt for what you want to include, is that when I go this route, and I go into my course content, and I go into pre-K, and I go into wellness, and I go into health, and I go into lesson one, I don't get those checkboxes. But what I do get is the ability to click on this and look at the content. 
So this is what's going to take the time. Looking at the learning object saying, yes, I definitely want this. Notice it opens in a new tab. I'll close that tab. I go back I look at the next one. Is this something I want? So I tell people, get a notebook, write it down, start a spreadsheet, kind of write down everything you want to pull because most of the time you're not going to want to pull an entire folder sight unseen. You're going to want to look at each of those items. So that is one of my tips for you is if you want to do that quickly, if you want to put items in your course quickly, take the time first to go into resources and find what you're looking for and then do this import from resources in your course. Here's what I mean. You get the check boxes and you can add multiple objects at one time. Now, if you find something like a practice or a show it item after they've done the read it or the teach it, here's our big dilemma. This is what all of you probably know. And if you don't, here it is. What do I do with it? Because some of these items don't appear to be gradable. They don't appear to be anything that the students can submit to me as a teacher. So you have some options. Use it as a formative assessment. Create an assignment in Schoology that goes with it. Um, but I will say the one tip I'll give you too in importing everything is not the whole big folder, only the pieces that you want, and then determine how those pieces are going to factor into your students' grades. Some of it will be front-loading content for students, and then some of it will be their grades. And this is just an example of me um, adding a graded assignment based on a show it. So I've got a learning object, which is a show it, which is typically meaning the student will show what they know, but I don't like the way it's set up. There's no way for a student to submit something to me. So all I did was copy what was in there and add it to an assignment that I can get a grade for. So, um, so I think that is really significant to be able to do that so that you can get graded items. So once you have some items, those learning objects, you have them loaded into your course. This is um, a key piece that I'm going to be honest with you, I was not originally aware of. When we started moving this PLP content into our courses, and I may, my, my ATM people may say, oh, I totally knew that, Brandy. How did you not know it? Well, I'll just be real with you, and all of you will probably agree. I didn't get a lot of training on it. So it's been a lot of learning by fire. So this is a huge, huge tip. Once you have those learning objects pulled into your course, click over here on this gear and edit. So you may be thinking, do I have to do that with every one of these? You don't. If it has any interaction in it and you would like to have access to that interaction or you want it to be interactive at all, because what I found is some of these won't be interactive at all for your students, you do need to click edit and when you click edit, you're going to see this window. This box at the top, this um, schools PLP LTI is what you want to choose. Now, this is um, the piece that I didn't know when I originally started training on this. So I didn't tell people to do this. So they had a lot of items there that could have been interactive for students and they were not. So first of all, you want to do this for the show it items, for some of the practice items, and definitely for any assess it items. Then down here, you don't have to adjust the title if you don't want to. Don't mess with the URL. Down here, you've got to decide, am I gonna enable grading? Now my A10 people can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but the enable grading is particularly important if you're going to use one of their assess it tools. Um, but you do not have to check that if you're just doing a practice it or a show it. Um, if you're going to do that, then you're probably better off just enclosing that concept in an assignment. But we want to enable grading if we're doing anything that is considered an assess it learning object. The other option here is this align button. 
And um, you may not be aware and you may be like, look, I'm just in survival mode. I haven't really thought about doing this, but you can go in and actually align your assignments with your standards. So if I go right here into this and I am going to um, edit this particular one, so notice I didn't mess with this because it is just a teach it or read it, no interactive part. But if I wanted to, I could go here to align and down here I have the state standards. I can click Alabama, course of study, language arts, and I can drill down in and I can find the exact standards that go with this particular learning object, especially for practice it, show it, or assess it pieces. The benefit to doing this, and you may be like not ready to do this, the benefit to doing this is that as you start getting better in the Schoology platform, you're gonna notice that, that it will track students' progress with these standards if you have aligned them on different activities. So I think that that is a really key piece here because we all know there are gonna be a lot of students with a big learning gap or slide this year, just because it is what it is, it's a crazy year. And so by documenting some of these standards, then you'll be able to pinpoint where they are behind and how they're struggling in a particular standard. Um, so anyway, you can click through these and you just check mark the ones that work with that and click add learning objectives and then save changes and they will be indicated right there on that particular learning object. Um, so that is a really neat feature that I just don't think is really utilized enough with our teachers is the align piece that can be found in assignments, assessments, um, all of that. So just pay close attention to that align button. All right, moving on. Two, um, if you come across something like a show it, that all of a sudden you go, this is a pretty good activity, but how the heck are they gonna send this to me? It says print out a PDF. Um, and this is probably the biggest question that's asked constantly in the different Facebook groups, um, emails that I get. It is, what do I do? It's a PDF. So how do the kids write on it? Um, so the one tip I would tell you is there is a print button um, that you can click and that will pull everything up into like print mode so that you'll get a PDF of the content that exists in the show it piece. You can print it or you can choose save as a PDF. Most of the time in your printer options, you have save as a PDF. So it would allow you to save this whole show it assignment as one big PDF. Um, the other option, once you have that PDF, you have some options. You can use a program like Cami or Doc Hub, which are both Chrome extensions. And students can use that to type on or annotate on top of that PDF. So they could use that extension when they open that PDF, write on it, submit it back to you. Another option, they, you can just attach that PDF to an assignment in Schoology and ask the students to essentially like write on their own paper. I mean, we're used to that, hand everybody out a class set of these um, tests, write on your own paper, have them do that. They have a submission box, write on your own paper. The other option is use the PDF in an, in an assessment, and I mean a Schoology assessment, the green puzzle piece. There is a drag and drop fill in the blank assessment type, and it is not difficult to set up, but that if you are really passionate about this, show it, and you want it to be a graded item in your class, those are some of the options. You guys may have found some creative options for this when it comes to PDFs, and if you have, you know, let me know that in the chat. Um, all right, so I'm gonna take just a quick minute and um, see if there's anything I need to address in the chat or if there's any um, comments or questions anybody wants to uh, bring up, any of my Tim folks. 
Uh, just looking back over it. So people are like, yes, I know that live binder lady. Uh, Carol mentioned PDF Candy. That's also a really good third party site that students can use. It's pretty simple. Uh, let's see. Um, so I will mention, and I have this um, right here, that the Chrome extensions, if, if you are going to have them use a Chrome extension, this is something the students will have to have in their Chrome browser installed. So this is something a district could push out to manage Chromebooks, or the student can simply go to this Chrome web store, click on something like Cami, and where this says remove, they would install. It's a one-time installation, and then it is then available up here in their browser to use at any time. And so that is how you use those extensions like Cami or Doc Hub, um, but the student would have to install that extension. Um, and so that is one uh, piece. If your district didn't buy Cami or they have not pushed out extensions, it would be just a, a short time of teaching those students how to do that. All right, we're going to move on then to the next thing. Grading. So this is the tough part. Because I can be really real with you. I don't have students that I'm grading. So a lot of what we've been doing as ATEM specialists is getting a fake student, submitting something, I grade it, send it back, see what it looks like. Um, that's the thing I recommend to teachers all the time. Get a buddy, a buddy teacher, make them a student in your class and practice that digital workflow. That's been probably the most helpful thing. And some of you may have other um, strategies. Like when I had a, a child in the school system, when I worked in the school system, I totally made that kid my guinea pig and I would try things out. And so that's one thing that we see a lot of people doing. So whenever you have something like an assess it piece in schools PLP, so I have now pulled in this learning object from Schools PLP. It is an assess it piece. So I took that extra step, I edited it, and I made sure the Schools PLP LTI is um, at the top. And I checked enable grading. So I'm ready to use this assessment with my students. I've got it set up for the student to use. On all of these assessment pieces, there's a submission piece. If you have not linked it to that school's PLP external tool, that step, then this will be submitted into the abyss. I don't know where it goes, but it's not gonna go to you. It's not gonna be something gradable. So every assess it has some sort of submission button. Now I know I've already heard some people that said, hey, my student says a submission button is not showing up. Well, you know, it's a little glitchy sometimes. So we always say log out, log back in. Um, teacher, make sure you have all the settings right. But for the most part, they should see submission and attachments. So depending on what this assess it piece is asking, the student has an opportunity to submit something back to the teacher. So for this particular one, this student was asked to create um, a poster. That was their assessment. So instead, I change it, say there's a digital poster. I want them to do it in Google Draw. I want them to do it in Canva or whatever, PowerPoint even, they can make a slide. So I'm ready for them to create that and submit it back to me. That is the assessment. So when they click submission, the students will get this box right here. It's pretty versatile. They can type directly into it. They have some formatting tools. They can put a hyperlink there. So if your students are going out and doing something on OneDrive or Google Drive and it's glitchy and they can't get things to work there, they could simply put the link here. They can upload a picture directly um, and paste it right here into that submission box. They can add a YouTube video. They can do their own video response or audio response, which I think is a great tool here. And then at the bottom, you've got add an attachment. So this is where if I did go out and create something in Google Draw or wherever and I downloaded it, I can attach it to this assignment. So if it is not um, 
you know, if it is not that where they're going to have a poster that they have to make, if it's something that is self grading, um, I'm going to be going to this grader piece. So once you can submit everything, regardless on the teacher's end and back to this, this is what the kid sees. Now we're on the teacher end. So I am at this assignment and I have said enable grading. And once I do that, when I click to view the assignment, I'm going to see activity and grader and analytics. Okay, so that grader is what you're going to click on. And notice down here at the bottom, my student is down there and they're hyperlinked. So once I click that, it's going to show me the grading shell for this assess it item. Now, I did want to point this out. Let's imagine that this is a quiz. It has some multiple choice, but it has a short answer. It will grade the multiple choice pieces. It will not grade the short answer. And you will have to go in and assign a grade to any of the short answer first. Once you do that, it will pick up that point value and all the other missed and um, correct answers and give a grade for this assignment. So this one is an example, it just had the one item. There's the attachment. Notice that I attached it as a PDF. Could have been a picture, could have been a document, could have been anything. This is that poster that I created or the student created. Over here, this is where I can grade it. So I can give a grade. If I just wanna give everybody full credit, like participation, everybody did it, I click full credit and it auto populates 100. If they get no credit, because there's nothing there, I just click no credit, or I can add a point value. And then also I have feedback. Notice I can do audio or video feedback. Um, and I can choose if that's visible to the student, which most people would want it to be. Then we get into the grade book. And I honestly have not talked a lot about the grade book and grade setup, because as many of you know, this year, Schoology does not sync with iNow. Next year it will, it'll sync in PowerSchool. So the one thing I am telling people is if you're not fooling with this now, after the first of the year, get some practice with the grade book. Because I say now's the time to screw it up, like kick the tires, um, do it wrong and see what it looks like. Next year it will automatically sync to the grade book. And it'd be my luck that a parent would log in and see it where I've screwed something up. So as I practice this, so when it comes to the grade book, if you've checked enable grading, you're going to see all of those items that have enable grading set right here. Um, if it is something that you created an assignment or an assessment, it's automatically going to be here. If you said it is a graded element. So you'll see the assignment, you'll see the point values. And then I just highlighted this because notice you can add some things here. So let's say it's something that's not in Schoology, but I want them to see like their, their whole grade right here. I can add items. Maybe it is um, a quiz in a Google form that I had them do outside of Schoology. I can manually put those grades in here and then they will sync up. So just something to think about um, right here in the grade book, even though it doesn't currently um, sync, um, that is one thing you want to um, fool with. And uh, this is embarrassing to say, obviously I just clicked through and like fake took these and now I'm straight up an F student. So sorry, I'm not a very good example of a student. I should have done better on my quizzes. I did want to mention this, even though this is not specific to schools PLP, um, the biggest thing I'm seeing with a lot of teachers is trying to keep students on task, trying to see what they've done, what they've completed, what they haven't even looked at. Completion rules um, is the key to this. And I am just advising everybody to go to this link. This is the Schoology Help Center. It gives the best explanation of the student completion rules. And if you click there, you'll see all of the details. But I want to show you student completion rules live in the course. So right here, if you'll notice in my course, there is this little grayed out part that says must view item, must score at least a 65, must view. That means I've set up completion rules for my students. 
so that they have to do these items and I can click student progress and then check their progress. Notice 67%. That student has done 67% of the progress in this folder. And if I had more students here, you would see that from them. Um, the way you set those up is that they can either be set up at the top of the course. So if I go here to the top of the course, I can go to options, student completion, and set up my completion rules here. The first one, make all folders sequential, means it doesn't matter what the due date is, they have to do everything in order. They can't even open the next thing or go to the next thing unless they've done things in order. Um, and so I can click add requirement. Because I'm at the folder level, I'm just gonna get folders. And I'm only gonna have complete as an option. So I'm gonna cancel that. And I encourage people to drill into the folder, into the course where you have assignments. That's where I say, set up your student completion rules. By doing it here, and I know people are like, that's tedious, you have to do each item. You don't have to do each item. Just do enough that you bluff them into believing they should open every item. So notice I have all of the different learning objects and assignments here. If I click one that is an assess it, it is going to give me the option of just viewing it or score. Um, if I use an actual Schoology assignment or assessment, it gives me something further like made a submission. And so you can set those rules to be as specific as you want them to be. Um, and that is going to help keep you uh, tracking student progress and keep students honest that they at least click through it because we all know we make an assignment, kids immediately look for what's graded. They totally ignore all the content. That would be like them sleeping in your class all day and only waking up to take the test. Like that would be foolish. But that's essentially what's happening with our virtual um, and remote learning. We're putting out content there for the kids to view, but if it's not graded, there's no accountability to it, they're just gonna ignore that. So I would recommend those student completion rules um, go here to the Schoology Help Center and get all the details on how to do those um, because I think that they are going to be very handy for teachers. All right, lessons learned. So I have been out to districts and I have talked with some teachers and these two ladies I would say are for me in my region are some of my gurus. Um, Brooke McFry from Sachs Elementary School, she is, um, they have designated virtual teachers and they are working as a team to create the lessons, pull in the content, and then share that in a group with the district. And this is um, Calhoun County, it's a large district, multiple buildings. And so they have decided to divide and conquer and Brooke has had a lot of experience with that. Um, Jordan actually met her because Etowah County is using the school's PLP, not just the content, but the whole learning management system. And so she and I talked a lot about the content, how she's using it in that area. Um, but I asked her just for giving us some information about her advice on that content. So I just wanted to share with you some things that they said um, that might be helpful. She said on finding lessons. Once you find a lesson, she likes to rename the folder or the assignment to something you'll understand. Instead of it being lesson four, she names it finding the theme in the Raven. It's a great tip because you're going to start seeing lesson four, lesson six. What is that? So once you have it pulled into your course, you can rename that folder. Um, assessments. She said the assessments are not very consistent. Some are challenging, some are, take five minutes. And this is why you have to look at the content. She says she likes to go through the show it parts of the lessons before she starts looking at the content. I thought that was a great tip. So she's saying, look at that pacing guide. And there's a pacing guide in each of the courses in Schools PLP. Look at that and find which of those folders contains show it. Find the show it look at it and see if that content that it's asking them to show is something you need in your course. Um, and then others, she had to get over the fact that the virtual students just will not get the same value from a lesson that traditional students will get. 
can I get an amen for that? Like I know all the teacher, I don't know any teachers right now that are going, I just love virtual. Give me virtual 100% of the time. Most teachers are like, I want my kids in class because that's when they're getting the best of me. This is a struggle. Like right now, this is a struggle. I'm like, hello, are y'all out there? I know you feel like that. And so I thought this was a great point. Like give yourself a pass. Understand you're gonna do the best you can and put that out there for the virtual students, but the best they're gonna get is in that classroom. That's why we have a job. That's why we are professionals. All right, so here's some of Brooke's lessons learned. The live binder is essential reading and can answer many questions. Now, I will attest to that. I jumped into this and many of us did trying to train people. And when that live binder showed up, I was like, that thing is big. I don't have time to look at that. But do you know that a lot of questions I had, they had already dropped some content in there. It was just a matter of finding it. Um, so take a little bit of time with that if you have questions um, and see if you can find the answer there. Consult the pacing guides. Everybody has said this. I'll mention again that little control F or command F to search for terms or standards in those pacing guides. That's huge. And this is my favorite phrase of 2020. It is what it is. Be prepared, ooh, not typo, sorry, for glitches. That means crossword puzzles that don't work, jumping reading toolbars, screen scrolling on its own, multiple scroll bars within a screen that have one or two that don't work. Progress bar output, completion guides that don't match. It is what it is at this point. And we are all just surviving. And she said, just be prepared. Um, her advice for adding content, add it directly to your course, then copy it from there. She says, if you add it to the resource folder first, sometimes it causes issues when students want to submit. I did not know that. So she says, find it in the group resources, put it in a course, manipulate it there, and then copy it into other places. And then grading, if you want to show it lesson to be graded, attach it to a Schoology assignment. And that's what I was just talking about earlier. If you want students to do a master assess it, it needs to be standalone. It needs to live outside of a Schoology assessment. So those are really some really good tips. So I did want to leave some time for some questions, for some comments, anything that you want to share with your experience with um, Schools PLP and Schoology. Uh, so feel free, we're a pretty small group. If you want to uh, add something in the chat or unmute your mic and um, let's talk about any obstacles that you have had. Anyone? Hey, Brandy. Yeah. You know I have an idea. Oh, I, I love it. Tell it, Barry. You know I always have ideas too, so tell it. Yes. Let's well go ahead and go ahead and talk to Miss Lopez first. And yes. I'll be I'll go find my screenshot. Awesome. All right. So I've seen some teachers who attach a Google form embedded in Schoology as an assignment. Yes, so that can be done and I'm just going to um, share my screen really quickly and show you how to do that because I think that that's a quick answer. Of course, you know, I say that and then I don't have a Google form like ready to um, to share. Um, the one thing I will tell you, though, is that the easiest way not to embed it, but just to add it is to simply do an add file link or external tool. You can grab the link that you would share a Google form and just add it here. It doesn't embed it, but it allows the student to open it. Um, I do know some people that have had some issues with the lockdown browser piece if they embed it. But basically with embedding, and this is the way I do it, and there may be a better way to do it, is that I do add a page. I hope that this is correct. I haven't done this in a minute is I go and I do add a page. So I'm gonna call this Google Form. Um, and with this Google Form, I have the option to insert content. And so when I go to my Google Drive app, is that, uh, that's not the way I do it, hold on. Somebody jump in here, because it's been a minute since I did this. I don't think Forms gives me the option here, does it? 
look, I'm like, I got this. I totally can answer this one. And then I just remembered you can't do that. So with a form here, I don't get a checkbox where I would normally say like add this or import this. I can't do that with a form. So I think that I did... Sorry, you just threw me because I'm, I normally can just answer this question and I'm drawing a blank. Hey, Tim, y'all got help for me? Add a link. Is it add a, right here? Mm-hmm. And then you'd put the link to the form. Okay. But I don't know if that actually embeds it. It doesn't embed it. Okay. I think what I might have done is in the page is add an image. I think that's what I did. So what I would do is go back to add a page, Google form. And right here, I would go to image and media. And I'm going to go from the web. I think this is right. And I'm going to choose media. Notice it's going to be a link embed. I believe that is where I can put that and it will embed it. But I may have to get back to you. You may have to shoot me an email because like right now I'm so deep into school's PLP. Like my brain is not working on this, even though I've taught this. <laughs> hey, Brandy. Yeah. Uh, while, you, while you were doing that, I yep. went and opened up a Google form and I went to send. Yes. Right. Uh -huh. On the send, there's a link to get the embed code. Yes. You could put in a page and then go click on the HTML and embed the code there and you would have that form embedded on a page. And I think the, the step that I just did, which is this image media from the web, by mm -hmm. choosing media, I can put an embed code there and yes. that's what Barry's talking about. So instead yes. of choosing hyperlink, the little chain link, you're going to choose the embed code. Is that what you're saying? Barry? Yeah, you can do it the same way, what you're doing right there. Yes, you'd paste that embed code right paste there. Paste that code there, and it would be inserted there. I don't have a Google form just called up really quickly, um, and it might take me like 10 minutes to find one if I was trying to do that. But, yes, I think that's whether, whether you add the link or embed it, they're still just going to be filling it out, you know? Yeah, they're going to be filling it out on the web, so, yes. Yeah, outside of Schoology. Right, right. Yeah. All right. Barry, what was your other idea? Oh, <laughs> Check this out. Uh, let me go. Let me go grab my screenshot, and I'm going to throw it into chat. Okay. Okay. Or you can share your screen. I don't care. No, that's okay. Okay. Um, okay. Here it is. All right. You share your screen, and then click on that. Click on that screenshot. Let's let's I'm talk about. Trying. It. There we go. Okay. I'm, I'm not... Oh, I got to share screen again. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what am I looking at? You're like, you're looking at something, but we're not looking at anything. <laughs> there it is. All right, get this. If I were doing this in a course, this is a group of folders that's pulled in from Schools PLP. I would bring in the whole course into a sandbox so that I could play with it and delete the stuff I didn't want and find the good stuff, but it's not cluttering up my course. I don't even have it in my course and have it unpublished. I put it there. And when I'm ready to bring over a folder, I just click the gear next to the folder and say, copy to courses. And it will let me put it in one, two, three, as many courses as I want. That's a great point. So what he's saying is, and we've built a lot of uh, sandbox courses, obviously, because we're just teaching from these courses. But like here is a course, a demo course that's got, um, you know, all of these different classes in it. And I've added all these different pieces to it. And what he's saying though is, if I've got a whole folder of content, and of course I grab something here that doesn't have a whole folder of content. Um, but if I have a whole folder of content and I add that in like this lesson one, if I add it to, my sandbox course, because you can go in and create a course that's outside of those I now courses, and it's not going to mess anything up. That's a great idea. So I go here, I click in this, I find all the stuff I like, hide it, do whatever I'm going to do to it, and then go back to this folder level, 
And what he's saying is I go over here and I choose copy to courses. Now I can choose to send this to my course and I can choose specifically what folder it goes to and I can do it with a bunch of courses. So that's a great, great thing. Great thing about that is you may have one class that you got to this lesson, but another class there, they didn't get to it. So you can, you can then from your sandbox, drop it into your other courses as you need it. I don't know. I just, I would really do idea. that one. A little, we're all looking for any way to make it faster and easier. So that's a good tip. All right. And Brandy, I, I tested um, the embedding the Google form and you do add a page, you do insert an image, you do go to the send button, grab the embed link, okay. and then you do click on embed. And then there will be a little, when you hit update or save, there will be a little, um, icon with whatever you titled it when you click on it then it's actually embedded um, yes and actually when it comes to like a page and i forgot to mention this when you have a page published like this right here look at that i just happen to be on the embedded google form in a page hey i've done it before see i swear here's what it looks like yeah that's that's what, that's it, looks what it looks like, like but Notice I had to click it to get to it. If I go here to edit page and at the very bottom, I click this display in line and save changes. Now, when I go back to this folder, look at this. I don't even have to click this. The Google form is right there. So that strategy on embedding the form is the same, but you save a click if you click that display in line piece. All right, I noticed another good. question too. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. I was saying that's good. That's good yeah. to know. Um, all right, yes. Uh, somebody had, a, if students don't complete all the assignments when you have student completion, will it stop the other assignments from showing up? I believe that is correct. That is what I've been told. Maybe they will show up, but the students won't be able to submit anything on those. If I'm correct, I think I'm correct on that. Assessments, assignments, things that are graded, they won't be able to do them. It doesn't matter what the due date is if the student completion rules are set up so they have to do things in order. All right, so several of the other things have been addressed. Hey, Brandy. Yeah. Um, some of the uh, questions about the recording, mm -hmm. I typically send it out to the people who are registered. Um, you do you do that or are you going to just put it on the ATM website under Schoology? Um, it will be on the ATM website. If you go to the ATM, and I'll just go there really quick. I, I, dro I dropped them the link. Okay, yeah. If you go to the um, the ATM website, then you can access um, the Schoology page. And so if you go here to Schoology and Schools PLP. It's gonna open, I have like a whole Google site devoted to it. And up here at the top, it says ALSDE resources. And if you scroll down, it's here too, it's the same stuff. If you click right there, you'll see a blue folder, online folder of webinar recordings. And I should probably do a better job of putting that more toward the top, um, but that is where it is. If you click there, you're gonna see all of them. This one will live in this September ATM remote learning, but here's all the webinars. I don't know why, Barry, my face is on your webinar, by the way. I guess I talk too much. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> You're just prettier than I am. <laughs> all right. Um, I think we've answered the questions. You guys have had awesome questions. Um, I noticed um, Brent mentioned the Google slide trick. We've had several people suggest that. Um, if you want students to annotate or write on a PDF is being able to make that a picture and pull it into Google Slides. Um, yeah, that's another great there's I think Robert did a great session on like worksheet hacks and there's so many great videos on how to do that. Um, I just mentioned Cami and Those are two that I have used. So 
Um, I'll stick around for a minute. If you have any other questions, thank you all so much for attending. Um, I will be putting attendance in over the next couple of weeks. Give me some time because there's several webinars that we have to do that for. Um, but if you went through that registration link there in Zoom, uh, you should be good. And I'll get a report from this Zoom session too, telling me who was in the meeting. So thank you all so much for giving of your hour this afternoon and have a fantastic rest of the week. Thank you all people. Hey, I'm like struggling maybe, here. Let me see if I can, I can go and grab that video that you're talking about. Uh, someone's asking for the one about assessments. Yes. So I'll see if I can find that and send and put that in the chat. Yeah, I've said I wish that that wasn't like the webinars weren't in a Google Drive folder. I'm glad somebody made some subfolders because that was hard to figure out where to find stuff. So I don't know who did the subfolders, but that was a good idea. I meant to ask where everybody's from. I'll have to look in my um, registration to see where all of our, we had, if we had people from, you know, similar districts or where our folks were from. All right, if there's no other questions. Oh, look, Selma, yay, I see some Selma people that are still hanging out. Um, Selma folks, are y'all traditional face-to-face -face or are y'all still doing some virtual? Virtual. Bless it. That's why they're here. Because they're like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> I love it. Well, I hope that this was helpful to you and, and we can help you any way we can. Just holler at us if you have a specific question. Um, we have like great brains thinking together. So if I can't answer it, one of these people, one of these smart people can do it. All right. Well, I am... Oh, I guess I can uh, cut off the recording.